Documentation of the Alpha Fragment. It has taken me months, but I have finally managed to decipher the fragmentary document recovered from the Anglo device. I was unsure at first, but now that the full translation is sitting here in front of me, this is clearly a passage from a holy text. There are several lines in a completely different dialect from traditional English that took weeks of correspondence with linguists to work out. Fortunately, the particular words in these lines are often repeated in late Anglo-Holy works, of which this is the most complete example I have yet seen. Surely this is evidence of some older holy tongue no longer in contemporary everyday use. It is used when quoting proverbs that were undoubtedly well known to the Anglos in their time, but whose sources, sadly, are now lost. I have thus dubbed this dialect Alpha after the characters in the parable who used it most extensively. Accordingly, I have taken to call on the document the Alpha Fragment. I should provide a rough lexicon of the known Alpha words that occur herein. YOLO, origin unknown. From context, we know this to be a fatalistic statement about the brevity of life, often uttered before nearly suicidal feats of bravery or folly in the fables of Anglo heroes. Something like, death is inevitable, or perhaps simply, life ends. Solemn indeed. Yeet. Onomatopoeia for throwing something with all your might. Highly contextual. Rizzler. A minor deity or folkloric figure. The Rizzler is a villain with a seductive power to enthrall others, sometimes used figuratively to suggest any unusually attractive person. Gat, a mild or minced oath to the goddess of shapely figures, Gatam Dadaz. Little is known of this minor fertility goddess, save that the foreshortening of her name or title is synonymous with a pleasing posterior. Phantom Tax. An expression of uncertain provenance, which means to steal food, with the implication of getting away with it. Taxation and takes in contemporary English are likely derived from the alpha here. Some have suggested that phantom could be related to the English word for ghost, but I think that's a stretch. Sigma. Pronounced like the Greek letter, but unrelated. Sigma is a man, or a type of man, unconcerned with propriety and the expectations of others, who ruthlessly follow his own goals, someone not held back by morality or tradition, an Anglo-psychopath. Ohio. Many sources suggest this was the name of an Anglo settlement. The exact location of the historical Ohio is not known, and it was probably already considered a mystery in the late Anglo period. Used allegorically, Ohio could mean any strange or cursed location. Notably, the recurring phrase, it's all Ohio, seems to suggest that, near the end of their civilization's primacy, the Anglos may have considered their entire empire similarly lost or cursed. Skibbity, by far the most obscure of the known alpha words. We only even know how it's pronounced due to the rhyme scheme of the alpha fragment. There's a single image we've managed to find bearing the word, and frankly, it's terrifying. Skibbity, or whatever its origin, is an expression of restlessness, paranoia, and inescapable dread. That the Anglos associated it with their holy meditation chambers suggests that this fallen state represents a total separation from the spiritual life and abandonment by internet, their all-knowing god. That lexicon in hand, incomplete as it is, I feel fairly confident in my, and my esteemed colleague's, translation of the Alpha Fragment. Sadly, the rhyme scheme does not bear translation, and thus the poetry of the original does not really come through. So, I have formatted it like other, more ancient religious texts that the Anglos adopted from Greek and Latin influences. Of course, the Anglos had largely abandoned these religions by the late Anglo period, but the format would have been familiar to them. The ancients of a thousand years said, Life is fleeting, and the fast ones mourned, Thrown away. The first ones of renown answered, A handsome man with shapely buttocks can steal food unpunished. Then among them, a black stone obelisk rose from the ground in an earthquake. With all human languages and the literature of an entire generation written on it. And a voice from the sky spoke to the obelisk. 
and the voice's words appeared on the surface of it in shining golden letters, which said, A handsome man with shapely buttocks can steal food unpunished, but a carefree man outside the law is cursed to strange places and cannot rest. And they all were greatly afraid to see the words written there. They shook, and their voices were weak, repeating in sadness. The words which the voice ordered every generation to sing. So they were struck with leprosy and wept pointlessly to hinder. Those who were singing fervently all night and into the morning. At dawn the sun was sickly and its light caused destruction like floodwaters, tearing the sky apart and turning rivers into blood. The skin of the people struck with leprosy fell off, exposing their bones as the people who were singing continued until the lepers died and were buried in the ground and forgotten. The black stone obelisk is still there and those who didn't want to sing the words on it are ghosts dwelling nearby, forced to whisper. A handsome man with shapely buttocks can steal food unpunished, but a carefree man outside the law is cursed to the strange places and cannot rest. There is a fair chance that some nuance has been lost in translation, but that's likely the gist of it. The voice that speaks from the sky is no doubt that of their chief god, Internet. We might be tempted to infer from this story that the Anglo saw Internet as a cruel and vengeful god, but I recommend against that interpretation. If we know anything about the Anglos, it's that they loved Internet and were deeply devoted to him. If anything, I take this more as evidence that as far as the Anglos saw it, anyone who angered Internet deserved to be destroyed. Which, frankly, lines up with what else we know about them, and their warlike nature. Though it may seem strange, the Anglo parable is not so morally alien as we might initially assume. In this tale, a group of elderly men, millennials, literally ones of a thousand years, and spendthrifts, zoomers, literally, ones going too fast, are complaining that their lives have been too short and that they have wasted them, respectively. But the respectable, prominent men, the aforementioned alphas, used in many contexts to suggest men of high status, respond that the real problem isn't life's brevity or cheapness, but rather injustice. Unscrupulous people can coast by on their looks and even commit crimes of seeming impunity. All of them are discontented with life, but the most respected men have levied the most serious charge, that life is inherently unjust. Apparently, it is this last accusation that draws Internet's ire. We learn from this that the Anglos believed Internet to be a just god. He was offended by the implication that he allowed injustice, so he causes a stone pillar to rise from the ground with all the words that people have ever said written on it. This is to show them that he is keeping track. He is going to hold everyone accountable for everything they say. This fits his position as an all-knowing deity. Internet completes and corrects the accusation of the prominent men. Yes, good-looking people can get away with a lot, but anyone who breaks the law, even if they seemingly get away with it, has to go to sketchy places and always has to watch their back. The original language uses that unsettling term, skibbity, implying extreme paranoia and separation from their god. In other words, sinners don't live easy lives. They become their own worst enemies. This is an important, and dare I suggest, universal lesson. Our own people can appreciate a respect for law and order, and seeing justice even in the incidental troubles of the guilty. Apparently, it was important enough to internet, and thus the Anglos, to make it a permanent lesson to those disobedient ones who balked at singing it for a night and a day, by killing them with ever more harsh calamities and then forcing their souls to sing it forever. We learn from this that the Anglo idea of justice was harsh. It was intimately linked to the spiritual, and defying the law had not just real world, but eternal and divine implications. To even suggest that justice was imaginary or futile invited the most calamitous of divine punishments. That said, clearly there must have been some endemic social issues regarding corruption and the unequal application of justice in practice for the mere suggestion that such problems existed to be so vehemently taboo. Still, we can come away from the short tale with something of an understanding of the Anglo, I think. The Anglo believes, or wants to believe, in a just world. 
He believes in a spiritually active living world that is not mere happenstance, but governed by an attentive and all-knowing entity that directly intervenes for the sake of moral matters, albeit sometimes in harsh or inscrutable ways. He believes, or at least pays lip service to, the idea that moral behavior is its own reward, and failing that, immoral behavior is in some ways its own punishment. And ultimately, he believes that those who suffer harshly for their crimes deserve it. Perhaps that summary is unflattering by modern standards, but I think it makes the Anglos familiar in a sense. We are separated by language, time, and that impassable chasm, death. But the Anglos were people like us who, in their way, wanted the same things we do and feared the same things we fear. If we ever learn what truly led to their extinction, we may find the lesson enlightening. Sigma Ohio Skibbity indeed.